Good afternoon. We're already a couple of minutes past. Uh, time for us to get started with our third session. I appreciate everyone who's been in here for the past couple of days. We've talked about how hope is that by nature which doesn't disappoint. And we looked at that the first day, that, we, that hope, biblically speaking, is that which doesn't disappoint. It is something that we expect, something that we look forward to, something that we have confidence in. And we contrasted biblical hope with worldly hope, that the hope that the world offers is always disappointing. And then we looked... Yesterday, it, we answered this question or looked to answer the question of how can we know that we can put our hope in God? How do we know that He won't disappoint? We looked at His perfect track record. But what is it that we hope for in Him? And today we're going to be talking about the future. Now many in our culture like to focus on the future, either by trying to figure out what's going to come what's, uh, or trying to have some positive effect on the future. I don't know about you, but whenever I scroll through social media, there's always some uh, link that pops up, some ad that pops up saying these are the top 10 stocks that you can invest in that are going to just go way up in the next year. If you invest in this stock, you'll be a millionaire in the next year. But we want to know what the future holds. Fortune telling is around a $2 billion a year industry because people want to know what's coming. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Let me look at your hand and I can tell you what's going to happen to you. We want to know what's coming to the point that people resort to things that are kind of silly. Or when we think about the future, many want to have a positive effect on the future, to be part of some cause. Many today have put their hope in trying to make the planet last forever. They're telling us now that in so many years we have to buy electric cars so that we're not polluting anymore because we want the planet to last forever. But the Bible tells us that it's not going to, it's all going to burn up at some point. Now I'm not suggesting, I want to be careful here, I'm not suggesting that we don't be responsible with what God has given us. But where's our hope? What are we hoping for in the future? What hope for the future do we have? Given that hope is a confident expectation, what is it that we're expecting? And I want to look at that from a biblical perspective. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8 to begin our lesson today. In Romans chapter 8, we'll be looking beginning in verse 14. Paul says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him." We see a number of really awesome blessings that we have in that passage there. If we're living by the Spirit of God, it says that we're His children. We've been adopted into His family. The Spirit, the Spirit lives in us and testifies to this fact that we belong to Him, that we are His children. We have the privilege of being able to address the Almighty, the Creator, as Father, that He listens. One of the benefits that children get is to be heirs, to have an inheritance. Paul speaks about that inheritance as well in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. And he talks about the Spirit's role in that inheritance there as well in Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14. He says, In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. It talks about the Spirit who is given as a, some versions will say a guarantee. The Spirit is given as a guarantee, a pledge. 
The word in the Greek there means earnest or a down payment. God has given us His Spirit is the first part of what we can expect to receive in being with Him for all of eternity. And it says there, with a view, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. A guarantee of where we get to spend our eternity. The Apostle Peter talks about our inheritance. In 1 Peter chapter 1. And we talk about our heavenly inheritance. This is one of my favorite passages that talks about it. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. We have a living hope for the salvation that's going to be revealed, but he talks there about the inheritance that we have to look forward to, something that we get to receive in the future. And notice he talks about several qualities of it. It's imperishable. Nothing's going to destroy it. It's not under any kind of a threat. It's undefiled. It won't fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. Now when we think about a reservation, what do you think about? What comes to your mind? It's something that's being saved, something that's being held. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be flying down to Abilene, Texas, and I have a reservation for a car, and I expect whenever I go to the rental car desk, they're going to have one there with my name on it that's being held. That's the idea of a reservation. You call ahead to a restaurant and say, I want to reserve a table. There's one over there. It's being held. They're not going to put someone else in it. It is reserved. It's a spot for you. And when we consider the inheritance, what we can expect to receive in the future from our God because we are in Jesus Christ, because we have that living hope, is He says there's a spot in heaven reserved for you. If you're in Christ, God has a place for you. Or it's as Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place, I'll come back again and receive you to myself. Isn't that incredible? The idea that if we're in Christ, we have a hope to receive a spot in the presence of God for all of eternity that He's saving for each and every one that chooses to live for him that chooses to obey him that chooses to walk in the light and we'll get to that just a little bit later on that's an incredible hope for the future reserved in heaven but as we consider this this hope of being in heaven that's where Christ is seated at the right hand of God what we have to look forward to in the future is that we get to be with him and we talked about the Thessalonian church a little bit yesterday. I want to revisit that today. Uh, just to remind you, and if anyone was not uh, in our session yesterday, let's go back to Acts chapter 17 again. And we're going to look at Paul's time in Thessalonica when the church was established. And then we're going to look at a, uh, at a part of the letter that he sent to the Thessalonians. In Acts chapter 17, I'll begin reading in verse 1. It says, When they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the, uh, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring, out, uh, bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. 
And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they stirred up the crowd, and the city authorities heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And so as we talked about yesterday, this means that there were uh, that Paul had to leave Thessalonica likely earlier than what he had intended. There were some things that he wanted to teach these people that he didn't have a chance to while he was there because persecution came around. And so you have a new church of baby Christians who don't know everything that they need, and Paul's got to leave. And so he informs them of some things in his letter. And so his letters to this church will help to fill them in on some of the issues, and one of them being what's going to happen to those who die in Christ. If one dies before Christ returns, what about them? Among other things, Paul wrote to give them assurance that one who dies will not lose their reward. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul speaks about his longing to come to them. He says, uh, he says there, uh, We night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and complete what is lacking in your faith. There are some things that they still needed. And then when you get to chapter 4, Paul begins to address uh, one of those issues. Chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, and here's where we get to our future. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. Well, let's stop right there for just a minute. He's talking about, and we'll see this, uh, what we see there, he's talking about those who have died in Christ. And he says, those who don't have Christ, they grieve. And everybody, when someone close to us passes away, we grieve. But he says, the grieving of a Christian, the grieving of one who is in Christ, and who understands what that person who has died in Christ is looking forward to, the grieving is very different. We have hope. We know that those who are in Christ have something better to look forward to than what this life has to offer. There's hope. Hope for what? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now you remember the track record that we established for God yesterday. That God always keeps His promises. That God promised the impossible to Abraham and Sarah, and He fulfilled it. Nothing's too difficult for the Lord. And here, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, the Lord is coming back. And when He comes back, the dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We will always be with the Lord. When Christ returns, if you're in Him, whether you've passed from this life or you're still living, you get to go and be with Him forever. That's what our hope is. We get to be with our Savior. And what a comfort that is. When we look around at all of the nonsense, all of the chaos, all of the crazy things that are going on in our world that we know that in eternity, regardless of what our world throws at us, regardless of what the enemy throws at us, if we know that we are in Christ, that we have a future to look forward to of being with Him. What a comfort! Here's what's going to happen. Christ is coming back. We get to be with Him. Comfort one another with this. And some 2,000 years later, we still need to remind one another of that. Whenever our priorities start to get skewed, when we start to pay attention to other things rather than to Christ, when we see a brother or sister getting discouraged and our focus is changing, Jesus is coming back. That's a cure for discouragement. But I'm convinced that one of the greatest aspects of what we have to look forward to is the fact that we actually get to be with 
Jesus. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about the imagery of heaven, and I don't mean to diminish that with what we're saying. We talk about the pearly gates. We talk about the streets of gold. We talk about the different materials that are going to be used to build this wonderful place that we're going to be in. And I'm convinced as we look at it in Scripture that the inspired writers, as they speak of heaven, as they speak of where we get to go, are just simply using the best words, the best descriptions that we can possibly understand to describe something that's going to be so great that we can't even comprehend it. But, you know, we talk about, oh, we're going to walk on the streets of gold, and, and we think about heaven, and, you know, we talk a lot about heavenly asphalt. We sing about it, we talk about it, we look forward to it, And again, not to trivialize that, but who cares about the gold? Jesus is there. My Savior is there. The one who died for me is there. The one who created the universe and came here in human flesh and died on a cross for my sin is going to be there. That street will be beautiful, but I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. Comfort one another with these words. We will always be with the Lord. We won't have a threat of separation. The enemy's been defeated. He will be cast into his place. There won't be any more threat. There'll be no sin. There'll be no temptation. There'll be no threats there. Jesus will be there and all of his people. What a wonderful encouragement. What a wonderful hope. What a wonderful comfort. When we look around at all of the pain and the suffering and the troubles that we have in this life. But as we consider the fact that getting to be with Jesus is one of the greatest rewards, there are some other passages I want us to consider along those lines as well. Let's go to the second letter that Paul writes to the Thessalonians in chapter 1. But as he talks not just about the, the reward of getting to be with Jesus, but that's also related to one of the greatest aspects of the punishment on the other side of things. You know, as we saw in Acts chapter 17, Thessalonica started, the church there started as one that was persecuted. Paul was run out of town. He had to leave town in the middle of the night. The church in Thessalonica had some struggles. And Paul writes to them about those who were hostile to them. First, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6. It says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who have afflicted you, and give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. But notice what He says there, specifically in verse 9. They will be, they'll pay the ultimate penalty, there's the eternal destruction, and that is away from the presence of the Lord, away from Jesus Christ. You know, there are different ways that hell is described. We typically think about the fire and the brimstone uh, and who the company will be, you know, Kerry was talking about us earlier about our enemy and how terrible that would be to be in a place where he is. We consider who will be there. Let's also consider who won't. The punishment includes being away from the presence of Jesus Christ. Hell is a place that's prepared for the devil and his angels and it's not a place that anyone would want to end up. And one of those reasons is because it's where Jesus is not. There are two options in eternity. We can be with Him or we can be without Him. And that makes all the difference. And it depends on whether or not we choose to be with Him or without Him in this life. As we've been seeing in our spiritual warfare class earlier in the day, this life is a test. Are we going to follow Him? Or are we going to obey Him? What's in your heart? And that determines what's going to be in your future. One more passage before we move on from that is in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, as we consider the words of Jesus Himself. 
and speaking to those who are disobedient, speaking to those who won't be with him for eternity, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? We've got people who are doing things and claiming this is in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, I don't know you. They're going to be calling him, addressing him, Lord. Jesus says, I don't know you. Verse 23, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Depart from me. The judgment, the punishment that is pronounced, Jesus says, depart, get out of my presence, get away from me. The punishment is we don't get to be with him if we don't follow him in this life. And so while we have the hope, if we're in him, of getting to be with him, If we don't choose to follow Him, the opposite is true, that we don't get to be with Him. So as we consider eternity in the future, let's consider where we'll spend it in relation to where Jesus Christ is. But as we consider the hope of our future, not only will we get to be with Jesus as we follow Him, we get to be made like Him. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul speaks about, and this is a church that was divided and quarreling, and Paul speaks over and over again how they are to strive together for the gospel, how they are to consider one another as better or more significant, more important than themselves. And following the example of Jesus, in chapter 3, he talks about, here's the big picture, looking to the goal, looking to what's really important. And he says, there's one thing I do. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Here's the goal. is getting to be with Him. Here's what the, the big picture is. But notice in verse 20, first, uh, excuse me, Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. He's going to take who we are and what we are right now, take this body that has its aches and its pains and all of the things that that bother us about our existence, and we're going to make glorious as He is. This passage addresses both the location of our eternity in Him and also the transformation. John gives in 1 John chapter 3, he tells us that we can have confidence in this. 1 John 3 beginning in verse 1, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children, uh, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as, uh, as yet what we will be. And John said, we don't, we don't know what it's going to be like yet. We're His children. He says, he says that makes that statement there, such we are. The future's coming. We don't know what that's going to be like. But notice what he says there at the end. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. We know that we will be made like Him. That's a confidence. That's not, a, well, uh, using the word the way the world does, well, I hope I get to be like Him. I think I might. We know that we will be like Him. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him, purifies Himself. Everyone who has this hope, this expectation, this confidence that we will be like Him, purifies Himself. It reinforces what we talked about a couple of days ago, that our hope of eternity motivates us to endure in following Jesus, to endure hardship, to endure persecution, to endure temptation, to endure what the world throws at us and what the enemy throws at us. If we have a hope of getting to be with Jesus and getting to be like Jesus, if we have that hope, We're going to be transformed. Everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself as He is pure. The Apostle Paul 
says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We don't have to go like we are into eternity, into heaven with Christ. We're going to be made so much better. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. And when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory through Him. We have hope through Him. We will be changed through Him. We will inherit an eternal inheritance through Him. We get to be with Him because of what He's done for us. Our sins have been removed through Him. Sin's been defeated. Death has no more sting. We don't have to be afraid of what's coming at the end of this life. As a matter of fact, I think if we even had just the the smallest understanding of what heaven's going to be like, of what it's going to be like to be in the presence of Jesus, we wouldn't... We wouldn't be able to wait for Him to come back. Come, Lord Jesus. We don't have to be afraid because we have hope. We get to be with Jesus. We will be like Jesus. We have an inheritance. But as we consider our future, I'd like to spend really the rest of our time this this afternoon looking at some of the things that the Apostle John tells us over in the book of 1 John. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible that tells us we can know our standing before our God. A couple of days ago, if Mark Jameson mentioned to us that one of the saddest things to hear is someone at the end of life say, I hope I'm saved. Because what that means is, I'm not really sure. I hope I've done enough. I hope I haven't sinned one too many times. I hope I've not messed up too big, done some sin that is just too egregious. I hope I'm saved. And that's a problem today. We see it sometimes in the church. Well, I just don't know if I've been good enough. We have people who aren't saved who think they are. People who are saved who aren't really sure. And often it comes down to legalism, thinking that we have to do enough to be good enough to do some big good thing or avoid doing all of the big bad things. Well, you know, and we justify a lot of times, well, I know I've done this and I've done this, but, I, you know, I've never murdered anybody. Yeah, I'm pretty good. That's not at all what the gospel is about. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, of course, in Christ we do have to be transformed into the likeness Uh, into His likeness and follow His example, but our salvation isn't based on our merit or or on our ability to earn it because we could never be good enough for that. Oh, I hope I'm good enough to be saved. I'm not and you're not either. That's why Jesus had to come to this earth. I know I haven't done enough. I know I'm not good enough. I know I'm saved though because Jesus is good enough and I trust in Him and He paid the price for me. I have sinned one too many times or really way more than one too many times in order to be saved, but He keeps on forgiving because I have the continual cleansing of the blood of Jesus. I can know that I'm saved. I'm so thankful that it doesn't depend on me because I would be in terrible trouble. First John is a book that gives confidence in our standing before God. In the version of the Bible that I'm using, the New American Standard, the John uses the term no, K-N-O-W, no, 36 times. That's not counting the times that he talks about our confidence. Is that where it shows up as well? In these short five chapters, he talks about things that we can know. 
over and over and over and repeats it. We don't have time to go through all of them, but we're going to look at a few of them this afternoon. In 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, he says, By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I've come to know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, in Him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. We can know that we know God. We can know that we are in relation with Him. We can know that we are in Him. And John says it right here by inspiration. We don't have to suppose or hope or think or feel like or rely on our emotions. John says we can know. But do you know that you're saved? If someone asks you today, are you going to heaven? Could you say yes with confidence? Not based on your own performance, but based on Jesus Christ. We know that we know Him, He says, because we do what He says. Jesus also said in John 14 and verse 15, that's how we know that we love Him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Commandment keeping is a good way to describe what's meant in in 1 John 1 and verse 7 when He says, if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His Son cleanses us from all sin. When we're walking in the light, when we're walking by obedience, when we're following the example of Jesus, or as he says in 2 and verse 6, walking in the same manner as he walked, we have the continued cleansing. And we don't have to doubt that. We can know that we are in him because John says we can. If I claim to be his, I'm obligated to walk as he walked. But if I am in him, if I am obeying him, I don't have to be uncertain of my future. I don't have to be uncertain of where I stand before the Almighty. In 1 John chapter 2, coming on down a little bit further in that chapter to verse 15, he says, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. We can know that we're going to live forever because our love and our loyalty are not to this world. James says in James 4 and verse 4 that friendship with the world is hostility with God. But John says here that when we... uh, that the one who is doing the will of God will live forever. This world is passing away. All the things that it has to offer are temporary. 2 Peter chapter 3 tells us that it's all going to be burned up. Why would we sacrifice ourselves for that? Why would we put our stock in that? Why would we put our hope in that? We've already been promised by a God with a perfect track record who always keeps His word, who cannot lie, who can do the impossible. The world's going to be burned up. Why in the world do we want to put our hope in what's not going to exist? John didn't write that as a question, but as a statement. The one who does the will of God lives forever. And we can know that we'll live forever forever by striving to do His will, by walking in the light. A little further on, chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29, he says, And the little children abide in Him, so that when He appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Now over and over again, and this was pointed out in Isaiah 6 a little bit earlier today, whenever someone comes into the presence of God, they see the glory of God, you always see them on their face and very quickly aware of just how sinful they are. Isaiah said, I'm ruined. He recognized he was because he was a sinner. Abide in him. 
so that when He appears, we can have confidence. We don't have to shrink away in shame when He comes. Why don't we have shame when Jesus returns? It's because we have the blood of Jesus that's taken away everything that we have to be ashamed of. Oh, I've, if, if you look at my track record and what I've actually done, I've got a whole long list of things that I could list off until, well, the end of my life just from what I've done now just to get through it of things that I could be ashamed of. But the blood of Jesus has removed every one of them. And when Jesus comes back, I don't have to be ashamed because of Jesus, my record is clean. My sin's been removed. In Colossians chapter 1 Paul writes about this. He says, Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, How is He going to present us that way? He says in verse 20 of that same chapter, Colossians 1, because Christ made peace through the blood of His cross. There was hostility between us and God because of our sin. Christ removed that by shedding His blood, by offering Himself as the perfect sacrifice. And so we can be presented to God holy, blameless, beyond reproach in such a state that an accusation won't stick. And do we ever have one who's trying to accuse us? Revelation 12 and verse 10 says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us before God day and night, but because of the blood of Christ, the charges just won't stick. The blood of Christ keeps on cleansing as we walk in the light. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. You know, we often pray, and so we should, we often pray, Lord, please forgive me. Lord, I've messed up for the millionth time. Please forgive me. And we absolutely should when we mess up. But we should also pray in light of what Scripture says, God, thank you for not counting my sins against me. Thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus offered that makes it so there's not a sin on my record. Before God, we'll be able to stand beyond reproach. Unable to be accused, a charge won't stick. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, or excuse me, verse 13. John gives the purpose statement for why he wrote this book. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. What an awesome hope. An expectation. A confidence. That I don't have to say, well, I think I'm saved. I might be saved. John says that I can know that I'm saved. That doesn't mean that we can't turn and walk away from Him. But as we walk in the light, as imperfect as that is, we can have confidence that when He comes back, we can stand before Him without a sin to our account because of Jesus. That our accuser cannot make a charge stick because of Jesus. It's a lot easier to march into the spiritual war that's going on when you know where you stand, when you know your ultimate outcome. That's how Paul, whenever he was in a Roman prison, could write to the Philippians all about joy and say to live as Christ and to die as gain because he knew where he was going at the end of his life. He knew that he got to go be with Christ. And he commented in that letter, he wrote in that letter, that's far better for me. The Gospel of John was written to create belief. The first letter of John was written to those who do believe to give confidence in our standing before God. Psalm 118 and verse 6 says, The Lord is for me, I will not fear. What can man do to me? If we have hope of eternity, if we know that our our future holds 
being in the presence of God. What can this world do to us? If we continue to stay with Him, if we continue to follow Jesus, if we continue to walk like Him and follow His example, our future is absolutely secure and we can be assured of it. If we face persecution, no one can take anything from us eternally. We can choose to walk away. But if we keep walking in the light, if we continue to follow Jesus, our future is absolutely secure. If the whole world turns against Christ and His people, we still have a future in Him. We still have an inheritance. We still have salvation. We still have hope. If the economy crashes, our inheritance won't lose any value. As a matter of fact, it'll look a whole lot more attractive If our preferred political candidate or party doesn't win, Jesus is still on the throne. He's still the King of Kings. He still has all authority. God offers us what this world can't. You know, we pay a lot of attention to the future. We want to know what the future holds, and people try all kinds of ways to figure that out. We can know what our eternal future holds. God offers us what the world can't. He offers us hope that doesn't disappoint. And we know that it won't disappoint because He has a perfect track record as one who can't tell a lie. God offers us a secure future with a guaranteed, reserved, heavenly inheritance where we have citizenship, where we, where we will be in the presence of our Savior forever. We have hope for an eternal future with Jesus that is absolutely secure. Do you believe that? Do you know that? Do you have hope in that? Would you bow with me? Our Father, we love you. And as we consider your word, uh, I pray that our love for you is growing, that our confidence, our assurance in you is growing. And we thank you that we can be fully assured of our future, that we can have hope. We thank you that our hope in you is not just wishful thinking or that it's uncertain, Father. We thank you that we can know that when Jesus comes back where we stand with you. And Father, I pray that that would inspire us to have confidence, to focus on our mission, to be focused on what's really important in this world is to bring more people to an eternity with you. Thank you, Father, for each one that's here. And I pray that as we go from here, that we would leave more assured, more confident in you, putting our hope in you and not in what this world offers. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.